What I've been doing for the last five years now is I've been mostly working on um, IgG glycosylation from the perspective of trying to turn this into something applicable for the wider community, uh, starting from longevity field, but also ultimately the goal is to turn this into something that uh, the biomedical community can ultimately use. So what we've been doing, we've been talking to a lot of clinicians, we've been talking to a lot of medical doctors, to a lot of scientists from different fields, and today I'm going to present you a little bit of an outsider's perspective on what IgG glycosylation could be and where it is now and what are some of the obstacles to get where we want to be. But first, I need to present to you a little bit about the IgG glycosylation, which is a focus um, of our lab and a focus of the group that I've been working it for the last uh, five years. And um, there, is, uh, there are two conserved sites on the uh, constant region of the IgG, and then there are also uh, two other possible sites on the variable region of the IgG. And there is this very nice, I don't know if you can see the arrow, is there a pointer perhaps? Well, never mind. Okay. Um, yeah, here, you can see the arrow. So this is where IgG glycosylation is located. Okay, great. Here. So this is where IgG glycosylation is located when you look at the crystal structure of IgG. And why this is relevant, it's uh, because it is located uh, very close to the region where there are binding sites, uh, for instance, uh, FCR binding sites, which means that glycosylation, like Gordon nicely mentioned in the previous lecture, is not just a decoration, it's not just a close to the uh, IgG, it is basically something that gives it essential function. And in this case, glycosylation has a tremendous impact on uh, IgG effector function and any downstream interactions with the cells and the molecules of the immune system. Uh, one of the maybe best uh, studied and well-documented cases is uh, the case of the fucosylation, where, um, just like Gordon showed previously, there are now, I think, seven or eight uh, approved uh, monoclonal antibodies for treating cancers that are actually without the core fucosylation. Why? Because uh, IgG glycans without co core fucosylation uh, have a stronger ability to stimulate antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Now, the, there are well-documented now changes in, of IgG glycom in many, many different diseases, and usually there are some general trends, and these general trends of these documented changes are very similar uh, to aging. So what we believe we've been measuring for this entire time is in reality an accumulation of the chronic inflammation within someone's, uh, within bodies. And this uh, chronic inflammation is a culprit and it's in the background of many, many different known diseases. So naturally the question is, can we now use IgG glycans as biomarkers for these diseases? And now, of course, um, if we want to use it as a biomarker, how do we measure a performance of a biomarker? And uh, what is uh, used in many different studies is something called uh, receiver operator characteristic. Now, fun fact, this is actually a military technology developed in 1940s, and it's called receiver operator characteristic because it was developed for the operators of radar receivers uh, who are supposed to detect enemy objects in the fields. So every time you uh, create a <laughs> receiver operator characteristic in your paper, be aware that you're actually using military technology. Uh, which is today, of course, used in the fields of uh, medicine, in uh, 
many, many different scientific fields, even for machine learning uh, and so on. Now, what it actually plots is uh, sensitivity and one minus specificity. So sensitivity is a true positive uh, rate and the specificity is a false positive rate. And I found here a, a very nice like, characterization of what different values mean. And in this publication by Mandrakar et al., uh, it was basically defined that the values between 0 0.5 and the 0 0.7 are considered lower than acceptable, from 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 acceptable, uh, 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 would be excellent, and then anything higher than 0 0.9 would be considered outstanding performance of a biomarker. So. Uh, this is one of the examples from our lab uh, where uh, we look at IgG glycans. So in this case, the publication was actually focused on plasma glycans, but the, the GP9 peak, which is reported in women, is actually coming from an IgG. And it is um, a, a very good, even this one structure, uh, it's called GP5 here, so the picture here. So it is this structure. And it is actually a very nice uh, biomarker for cardiovascular events in women. And if we look at what is currently existing out there for uh, prediction of cardiovascular diseases and events, uh, it is uh, the most popular, of course, is C-reactive protein and high sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein. Now, the problem with that is if you want to measure a chronic inflammation and you're using something uh, that is an acute phase uh, inflammatory protein like CRP, which actually has a very, very short half-life, it has a half-life which is measured in hours. I don't know it now by heart, but it is somewhere between, I think, a couple of dozen hours to, let's say, three days, something like that. And what you would really need if you would now want to measure chronic inflammation with something like CRP, you would really need to have uh, longer uh, measurements or many, many different time points to truly determine the baseline. And it is used today. So as you can see, CRP is used for prediction of coronary heart disease events. It is used for recurrent cardiovascular disease. It is used for prediction, so HCRP is used for prediction of severe microvascular uh, dysfunction, uh, and so on, and so on. However, both CRP and high sensitivity CRP are subject to criticism uh, due to their sometimes uh, low functionality or low performance rates. And especially one of the things which is problematic is inconsistency with chronic inflammation in women around perimenopause and menopause. And this has been reported uh, by multiple studies. Even though perimenopause and menopause are actually recognized as a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. And this is where IgG glycans outperform CRP. Uh, so first of all, IgG, this specific IgG glycan structure is specific for women. And moreover, we do know that IgG glycans do respond to menopause, and we have some preliminary data showing that they do also respond uh, to hormone replacement therapy, and that some changes in these structures can be uh, observed upon the treatment. Now, the next uh, very nice example is uh, potential usage of IgG glycans as biomarkers for prediction of hypertension. And in this case, again, there is more data out there showing that it's not only, you know, an, something that accidentally happened, but in reality, when uh, uh, obese mice were uh, fed with a high-fat diet, they would get the pro-inflammatory IgG and they would get uh, the hypertension, what we consider currently pro-inflammatory IgG. Um, however, when this pro-inflammatory IgG by itself was put in a B-minus-minus mouse, which lacks its own IgG, 
what was observed that then these mice would also get hypertension. Now, if you would feed the mice with hypertension or supplement them with uh, N-acetyl-D-manosamine or MANEC, which is essentially a sialic acid precursor, what would happen is that these mice would then basically uh, remain obese, but they would no longer suffer from hypertension. So <laughs> um, what is currently used for a biomarker for uh, hypertension is a combination of anthropometry, blood parameters, spirometry, and so on. And uh, when you want to predict um, hypertension according to these values, you would get an area under the curve according to the ROC analysis of, let's say, 0.7 for men and 0.845 for women. Uh, and if you would look at Hg glycans, so the reported uh, AOC performance for hypertension is 0.994, uh, which falls within this outstanding range. Uh, so basically, <laughs> much better than what is currently available out there. Now, if we move from cardiovascular diseases just slightly towards the metabolic diseases and looked at IgG glycans as biomarkers for prediction of type 2 diabetes. Um, so currently what is available for the prediction of diabetes is um, there are 12 month prediction uh, based on 62 clinical variables. Uh, which, include, which are included in national uh, health checkup. So this is a publication coming from China. And these 62 clinical variables together generate an AOC of uh, 0.928. If you just remove uh, a part of these variables and now base the prediction on 27 clinical variables, you would get an AOC of 0.842 to 880 for 12 month prediction of diabetes. But if you look at IgG glycans and you use BMI and IgG glycans, so without any other clinical parameters, you can actually get an AOC of 0, uh, 0 0.78 uh, to predict the type 2 diabetes. And this was confirmed in 2000 twins, followed for over uh, 20 years, and this is not just a 12-month prediction. These glycans were actually able to, or were changed years before diabetes onset. So once again, outperforming 62 clinical variables together. Um, so if we move now into the area of neurological diseases, um, IgG glycans as biomarkers for prediction of Parkinson's. So currently there are a couple of different available measures for prediction of Parkinson's. For instance, the gait tremor diagnosis and disease prediction, uh, CSF for disease diagnosis, or, so cerebral spinal fluid, and the other inflammatory markers. And all of them give somewhat a good measure, so they're all in the range of 0.8 to the 0.9, which is already considered excellent. Uh, however, there is also a um, publication by Russell et al., which uh, generated or showed that uh, IgG glycans have an AOC of 0.970 for disease prediction in Parkinson's. <coughs> Not only that we can, in some cases, predict or maybe even sometimes diagnose the diseases, what we can also measure is the response of IgG glycans to intervention and therapy. And we have now a couple of publications showing this. Uh, for instance, one of the first ones was uh, the high-intensity interval training, which improved glycosylation in young and otherwise fit and healthy men. Uh, the next example is a caloric restriction 
uh, which has a very strong effect on the IgG glycome. And this was done um, on the Diogenes study uh, samples, where there is a very, very good documentation of also uh, other um, measures, metabolic measures. For instance, uh, there are measures of the blood pressure, of the weight, of the BMI, and so on and so on. What we can also see now when we move closer towards medical intervention is that a low calorie diet followed by an excessive weight loss as a result of bariatric surgery also causes a switch uh, in glycosylation towards more galactosylated and sialylated IgG structures which are observed more in young and healthy people. And a little bit of the preliminary, um, as yet unpublished, results of the hormone replacement therapy uh, show that basically introducing hormone replacement therapy uh, to women uh, in menopause actually is able to uh, reduce their uh, glycan biological age as measured by these pro-inflammatory glycans. So effectively, uh, their um, pro-inflammatory glycans were reduced, and they had higher amounts of glycans which are associated with young and healthy individuals upon the treatment with hormone replacement therapy. The potential is huge. So um, we could use IgG glycans uh, even when the body is still uh, in homeostasis for prediction of the potential diseases. Uh, we could use them in this uh, area of the disrupted homeostasis, which is before uh, the disease uh, has onset, before the onset of the disease, for the evaluation of lifestyle and medical interventions, which are supposed to bring us back to the homeostasis. And even after this point of no return into the disease, though I do acknowledge that even the existence of the point of no, uh, no return is very much discussed, it could be just a sliding bar between disrupted homeostasis and the real disease symptoms. Um, but for the purpose of this review paper that we wrote, we defined it as a point in which a simple lifestyle change is no longer sufficient uh, to introduce a real change uh, in the body's uh, functions, so then the, some sort of medical therapy is required. And even then, glycans could be used, for instance, for differential di diagnostics or even for therapy themselves, like it was nicely shown uh, in the case of uh, monoclonal antibodies. And now we come to the big question. If I've shown you today that IgG glycans can outperform uh, many of the traditionally and currently used measures for many, many of these diseases, why are they not yet used so much in the clinical setting? And one of the challenges, of course, is specificity. So when we look at IgG glycosylation, this is from a recent uh, review paper that we published, you can see that uh, very, very similar changes uh, of glycosylation, so these are glycosylation traits, so this is G0 in the center, are observed across many, many different diseases and even many, many different disease groups. Uh, so I've talked to many different clinicians over the course over the last, especially the last two years, and when you come to them with this, they are confused. Uh, you know, they ask, okay, so, you know, if these glycans are pro-inflammatory, if they're changed with so many different diseases, then how do we know what do we do? And one of the keys here is maybe to return back to the point of the chronic inflammation. Maybe we should stop thinking about it as, you know, specific diseases and think about in terms of managing the chronic inflammation. And however, even when we get down to the specific glycan structures, even then we have many, many, many different published associations uh, for 
you know, even one single glycan structure across many different diseases and many different disease groups. So starting from cardiometabolic to neurological, and this can be even in different directions. So what could be the possible solutions to this challenge number one? Um, one potential solution could be combination with existing biomarkers. A nice example that I found in the literature is combination of CA125, which is a biomarker for detection of ovarian cancer. But it has a poor specificity of 65.2%. Uh, now, if you combine CA125 with IgG glycans, it increases the specificity to 84.6%, as published by Xian et al. And this could be one possible route. The other could be more detailed IgG glycosylation analysis. For instance, there is still a lot to learn uh, when it comes to a, sub a subclass specific uh, glycosylation and to I antigen specific IgG glycosylation. And this is where IgG, you know, being such a complex molecule, actually also has advantage over many, many different proteins which are used in the diagnostics today. You can go so much deeper in the analysis. But then we come to challenge number two, and this is communication. Um, as Gordon nicely illustrated and previously shown this picture of a bird, this is something that we have to use every single time when we talk to someone about glycans. Because um, medical doctors, longevity specialists, uh, no one, even, even scientists from different fields have very, very basic knowledge about glycosylation. And we always need to return to this analogy of you know, showing them what glycosylation actually is. And this is a unique challenge because no one working in the field of genetics, epigenetics, proteomics, other omics fields has this challenge that we do. And this is something that we need to work on together uh, because it is a barrier which discourages medical community for early adaptation. And even in the longevity community, which is typically, you know, uh, very into trying something new and very bizarre things, but it's easier for them to understand something very simple and very basic. But when we come to the level of glycans, then they're like, ooh, but how do I explain this? You know, if I if I can't explain this to the people to whom I'm giving this test, then how do I use it? And I think one of the problems here is also the education. Um, and we are the community that needs to push this, the, the education field and top universities, even schools, to basically introduce uh, this general knowledge about glycosylation early on in the education, because it will make things easier further down the line. Now, the challenge number three is different methods, different outputs, and high level of knowledge required for data interpretation. So just uh, last week, I went to uh, Vienna. Uh, to one of the top institutes in Austria, which is a very international institute. And there I was talking to a head of mass spec facility, and they have in total one lab of all of the institutes in Vienna that is actually interested in looking into the glycosylation, probably because many others don't even know about it. And when I was talking to the head of the mass spec facility who did this glycosylation analysis for this one lab, um, and I was asking her, you know, do you want to actually move on? You know, do you want to learn more? Do you want to expand this, build a proper uh, facility in your institute to actually start looking at the glycosylation at a deeper level and not just proteomics? And she said, ooh, you know, this is, this is too challenging for us. We need a proper glycobiologist to do this. No, this is, you know, this would be too much for us. You know, it's fine when this one lab does it. We just give them the data and they do the interpretation themselves. But this is too much work for us. And this is a problem. This is a problem. Because we're talking, uh, you know, about a head of a mass spec facility. We're not talking about someone who is not familiar with science, who is not familiar with general methodology. 
So this is a huge barrier. Now, even, you know, if they do start looking into the glycosylation, we come to the challenge number four. No widely known and well accepted knowledge hubs and tools. And I will say now that, yes, there has been a tremendous progress done within the field of glycobiology in this area. I do acknowledge this. However, you know, when you talk to someone from a different field and you ask them, you know, okay, so let's compare this to something else. For instance, a basic local alignment search tool. You give someone, you know, a series of bases and you tell them, okay, do something about it. They will all go and blast it, right? They, everyone knows about blast. They will blast the gene. And this is actually a great marketing because it's, you know, something that everyone is familiar with and they don't need to think about and search I don't know how many papers and reviews and read and find out, you know, what are the best tools to use for the analysis and how to use them. And, you know, even when I went into some of these review papers and looked at some of these tools, they were no longer available even though the, tool, the, the paper was published in 2017. And this creates a huge confusion and huge barrier for anyone who is outside of field and trying to get into the uh, glycobiology. Um, so I do think this is something that we as a community, as Human Glycom Project, can make a tremendous progress on. You know, even if making up a new word is what it takes, and then we all use this word uh, and create a general, you know, one place where we collect all of these tools. So I do believe, yes, there are many, many challenges in front of us, and we are behind other omics fields, and this is showing. Uh, but I do believe this is the right place uh, to start creating solutions to these problems, would be also to further understand the problems in your own fields, in your own areas, outside of just glycobiology, you know, just talking to scientists from different backgrounds, talking to the medical community, and seeing why is it that they don't actually adapt uh, these tools that we do have, uh, that we can develop. And with that, I would like to thank specifically the team uh, who worked on writing this review paper. So, uh, Sofia, Anika, Lucia, Maya, and of course, uh, Gordon. Uh, who is uh, our head and, <laughs> and leader of Kenos. And, um, of course, I would like to thank our funding sources and thank you for listening to this lecture.